Welcome everyone, my name's Licia Grigi. Um, I'm here for an hour and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about nature photography, um, including wildlife and what it's like to work up in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. Uh, we'll also go into the brown bears of Alaska. So I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes just to make sure everyone can log on that's coming and, um, and then we'll get started. So welcome for those joining. Um, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes to make sure that we give enough time for people to log on. Um, my name's Lucia and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about nature photography and um, we're going to go into talking about shooting in the Arctic and Antarctica conditions and the regions um, and then I'll also focus quite a lot on a recent shoot that I just came back from uh, from Brooks Camp in Alaska. So we'll be talking about the grizzly bears and working with the new R system. Um, I had the opportunity to work down there with um, the R3, the Canon R3, and also the 400 2.8 RF lens. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how I experienced that and perhaps some tips. So um, for those who have just joined, um, my name's Lucia Grigi. I'm a nature wildlife photographer. I also work in film and today we're going to talk for an hour about nature photography and wildlife, talking about working in some remote regions up in the Arctic and Antarctica and we'll also go into the grizzly bears of Alaska. So I think we can probably get started. Um, first of all I'd like to thank Campkin's Cameras for actually inviting me today and um, I'm really excited to be talking at the Cambridge Photography Week. So for those who have joined, welcome and um, thanks for your time. And I hope um, going through this, you can get something out of it. Um, as we go along, um, you will, I, I can see the comments. So please feel free to, you know, write, um, write anytime if there's any questions you have um, and I can see those come up so I can answer those. If I don't answer them straight away, then I can get back to them you know, just after I finish sort of the area I'm talking about. But let's try and make this really interactive and, you know, I'm really welcoming to that. So please jump in and, and feel free. Also, you know, just let me know, um, you know, who we've got joining, what you're interested in. And um, yeah, hopefully you can come away with this feeling, um, yeah, rewarded and you can get something out of it. So let's let's start. Right, so this is a quick uh, breakdown of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to give you a, a brief history about sort of how I started as a photographer. Um, I've been a photographer over two decades now and, um, you know, the story of really from the beginning to how I sort of ventured into this, into this creative way and, and how I work predominantly in the surf and skate industry. Uh, then we'll go into a little bit about, you know, the transition from the action sport industry into wildlife and sort of the exploration around that. And then, you know, a little bit about working in the Arctic and Antarctica regions, because that is predominantly what I do. And then we'll go into the Grizzlies of Alaska, which is a recent shoot I just came back from um, out in Brooks Camp, which for those who uh, aren't familiar with that, that's a pretty special place in Katmai um, Nature Reserve where you can really get close and personal to the grizzlies. And then I'll make sure to leave, you know, 10 minutes at the end where we can have some Q and A's and, you know, I welcome a lot of open questions. So please feel free to um, comment in, in that comment line. Okay, so this is um, a photo I took actually not too long ago. Um, it's actually a wave that I photographed in Antarctica whilst I was down working um, in Elephant Island with, with some sort of chin strap penguins. But um, funnily enough, after my sort of surfing career had pretty much come to an end and I was already in this sort of wildlife realm, um, yeah, I had a really good opportunity to shoot some waves down there. So I always like to start with this because it's quite ironic, really, you know, after a decade or so of working in the action sport industry, which is it's quite competitive. Um, you know, I find one of sort of my best photos that got some cover shots um, so far south in Antarctica. And actually, if you look at the back of the wave, um, it's not the sky, but it's um, an iceberg. 
So it's, it's quite a unique shot and one which um, yeah, got published quite far. So I didn't start here. This is actually a picture of me swimming in, um, in Fiji at a wave called Cloudbreak. Um, I actually grew up between London and Venice. My mum was English and my dad um, is from Italy. And um, I hated the water. So it wasn't really something that came too naturally. Um, I studied in London. I did a scientific degree. I was into music and swimming, not in the sea, but in the pool. And um, when I sort of handed my dissertation in, I decided that I really wanted to move down to the beaches of Cornwall and really just start, you know, someone had introduced me to surfing. So surfing to me was something which I really wanted to do, but at the same time was quite scared to because I was really quite uncomfortable in the ocean. Um, so after many years of, you know, working and sort of, you know, practicing my surfing, um, I really, really wanted to start documenting the lifestyle of this. And I think this is really important because whatever you may be interested in, I think it really has to be a passion. And I think, you know, when you get into photography or when you want to nurture it to get to, a, you know, a professional level or, you know, push that professional level further, really what's going to keep you engaged is that love for what you shoot. And that could be action sport. It could be wildlife. It could be portraits. It could be photo documentary. It could be you know many, many things. So you know, fast forward five years, I started to travel around the world, I started to swim these big waves, and I had a commission or I was working for the World Surfing League, which is basically, you know, all the, um, all, all, all the contests and all, you know, following these surfers all around um, the globe um, to, to, to shoot them, really. And I sort of ate, overcame my fear of, um, of the water. And I felt that if I, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I felt if I had a camera in hand, I forgot about the fear of, you know, the darkness and the water and sort of being un underneath. Um, and I sort of really, you know, noticed that when I was recently on a shoot in the Galapagos when I didn't have my camera and I was swimming around and I suddenly just froze. So, you know, photography for me has really given back a lot. Um, this is an image I took in Fiji. It was one of the biggest swells that we had um, really ever in surfing history. Um, I would have been shooting on a jet ski here. Um, at the time, most of these shots were taken with, you know, the DSLR setup. So I was working um, with the 1DX. I was working with the 5D Mark III or IV. Um, here's some more images. This was, um, this was actually shot um, at a place called Pipeline in Hawaii. And what I really like about this image is that I was actually shooting with the 85 millimeter lens, but it was a 1.8 and it's actually relatively inexpensive. So, you know, this is a perfect example of really immersing yourself in shooting, um, but you don't have to have the most expensive kit. So, you know, having the 85 1.2 out there would have been way too heavy to swim around. Um, here's another image, um, which is of the same wave. And this was shot sort of backlit again, um, you know, all throughout my career of surfing. Again, this is um, in Fiji and, you know, some of the surfers there. I think I was using my 5D Mark III. That's, um, and that probably would have been maybe an 85 or the same as 200. So then we come to this image. And actually this is quite um, a significant image because although in the surf world, it wasn't an image of anyone famous or a surfer that would have gone on a cover, it actually at a time came when a lot of lifestyle brands were really searching for, you know, this niche, this niche sport to be put into mainstream. So, you know, car companies and I don't know, alcohol brands, like loads of mainstream brands were really looking for this adventure lifestyle. I think we really changed from a consumer economy going into this experience economy. And you know, it was around 2010, 2012, where, where, where people were really, really, really capitalizing on, on this kind of image and really selling this image for people to travel and, you know, get out there. So this image actually won an award back then with National Geographic. And that really put me on the grid to move out of the, the surf industry um, professionally. And, you know, I was, you know, other than getting covers, I had an agent in New York. I was based um, 
in Los Angeles and was doing most, mostly commercial lifestyle. So, you know, I started to make money at this point. Um, it was quite a cutthroat industry. So it definitely, you know, wasn't easy and very competitive. Um, and then, you know, at the, uh, sort of soon after that, I was working and doing a lot of publishing. So another avenue was, you know, I really had a passion for women who surf, like, you know, being a female myself, I really wanted to promote, you know, these amazing women that were surfing these massive waves. And so I did, you know, a couple of books, one on women who surf, um, and then 365 surfboards, which was an amazing time um, spent sort of traveling up and down the California coast, um, documenting all the types of surfboards we have. And then the skateboard book on the left there, um was documenting the dog town and the history of the actual skateboard so you know that really tied in as well so moving on um you know after i'd had this you know really quite amazing free life to travel around the world and chase some of these most amazing world uh, waves and you know have these relationships with the surfers to be able to put myself in the right position to shoot them you know, working for commercial brands from Billabong to Rip Curl, working for mainstream brand brands of car companies to working in editorial. Um, you know, my life took a bit of a change. Um, and I think, um, like anything really, you can, you know, it's really important to potentially focus on a particular area in photography. But I think naturally, you know, it's it's quite normal and quite easy to venture sort of outside that box and really start looking into other creative possibilities. So whether that's, you know, for me moving, you know, always being in nature, but moving from being underwater with the surf to now coming into more nature, like landscapes and wildlife, you know, it's still, for me, um, my love is still nature and, and to be out in the wild. Um, so um, just having a quick look before I get into the next bit with the wildlife, a couple of comments. So we've got, um, so hi, Helen. Um, so you're a newbie to wildlife photography and keen to hear any recommendations you have for dealing with the unexpected nature. Uh, let's see, look, the unexpected nature of, well, nature. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Not framing shots too slightly. Um, okay, well, that, um, will probably come up in the um, Alaskan bears. So we'll get on to that. And um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of those. So, right. So um, everything pretty much changed for me when I decided that I'd had enough of, you know, this action sport side. Um, I'd had enough of really working commercially and in the very cutthroat industry with agents. So I had a friend that was a marine biologist and she had said to me, um, have you ever thought about approaching, you know, some icebreakers or expedition vessels where potentially, you know, you can come on and we we go and do research and sometimes they have filmmakers to tell the stories. And I said, well, no, not really. But I mean, it would be great to, to try that. So um, I ended up finding myself on um, a Russian icebreaker or we were actually on another vessel. But this vessel here was also with us to break through the ice. And um, I went off to uh, the Russian Far East, uh, Siberia, and, you know, up into the Northeast Passage, which was basically circumnavigating the Arctic um, above Russia. So um, I went on this expedition and, you know, I was amazed to be able to, you know, start really immersing myself with wildlife. And this was a shot I took um, from a rib. So we were in a Zodiac and... Here you can see a, um, you know, a, a mother and a, and a cub and, you know, they were on the sea ice. So, you know, since, hi since this, I've, you know, traveled to the Arctic quite a few times after. And, you know, I've recently just come back from doing the Northwest Passage, which um, is a passage above Arctic Canada, which sort of goes into the Inuit communities. And we also were fortunate to see um, some polar bears and, you know, it's really interesting how quick their environments are changing. Um, but, you know, working up in the Arctic, it's it's definitely different. It's definitely a place where, first of all, it's cold. So, you know, shooting and being out in the environment can get quite testing. I think always be prepared. So make sure you have, you know, all your waterproof layers, your thermals, a really, really, really good coat. Um, 
and just make sure your equipment is you know ready because a lot of the time you don't have much time to get that shot or to have with the wildlife because you know a lot of the time it is quite fleeting moments um and you know for here example you know you're not just you know waiting for this moment with wildlife but you're also having to really understand the conditions that you're shooting in because you're on the ice you're on the sea ice you know it's quite unstable conditions um so you've got a lot of factors to take in um this is an image i took with my 16 to 35 and really just to say you know make sure that when you do come into you know when you when you are shooting wildlife you know don't always focus on the zoomed in images like it's really important to always you know capture the environment that you're shooting in so make sure you bring a wide angle. Um, I tend to either shoot with my 16 to 35, uh, which now I'm on RF lens for Canon. And then um, sometimes um, I would choose to use a 2470, which is my EF lens, which you can use your EF lenses on the RF systems with an adapter. Um, and from my experience, I haven't you know, noticed any difference. Um, if anything, sometimes the EF seems a little sharper on the RF body. So. Um, you could really mix and match. Um, so this is a this is an expedition I did a few years ago, and I went down to mainland Antarctica, down to the South Pole, and I had the privilege of working with um, an emperor penguin colony down in Atka Bay, which is near a German research base, and you know it was a it was a few weeks or well it was about a month over Christmas, but. Um, yeah, it was quite overwhelming because I'd never really, you know, taken images of this particular species before. So, you know, like any wildlife photographer, I think it's really important that you, um, you know, understand your subject in order to anticipate the shots. So, you know, although I didn't have that necessarily experience with these um, and the same actually in a way with the brown bears, which we'll go into next, um, I think I always say I think you know, I've opened the account and you, you know, the next time you, you're going to be able to up that because you're really going to immerse yourself and understand the way in which they are. Um, so this is a junior Weddell, Weddell seal. This was actually taken down on the peninsula of Antarctica. Um, this is actually shot with a 300 millimeter 2.8. It's an EF lens um, and my 1DX. And, you know, I love the 300 millimeter lens. For me, I can handhold it with wildlife off a rib um, where, you know, really when you're shooting from the sea, you really can't um, handhold, uh, you, you sorry, you can't use um, like a, you know, really, a, well, you can't use a tripod. And, you know, a monopod is, is also, unless it's completely calm, is, is pointless. So the 300 is, is a really good option for a prime lens. Um, so this is the camp that we stay in. And this is down at Wolfang, which is a camp down um, in, in the mainland. This is how we access it. So we get jetted down uh, for the time we're down there and all the equipment is offloaded. This is sort of the social areas and some of the tents. Um, this is a Basler plane, so a utility plane in which for this particular shoot and the client of mine, um, they had mechanics and, and pilots down to sort of dis the, disable the windows and also have the doors taken off so we could be harnessed and actually shoot aerials across the um, continent. So this is a little uh, insight to what it takes to produce these kind of shoots. Um, these are containers that a lot of the gear is kept in. A lot of the access we take on the ground is, you know, over, is, is on sledges and snowmobiles. Um, this is an image of me actually in the plane, pretty tired after a while. So this is, you know, maybe not the most organized picture of all my kits, but um, it's, um, you know, an easy way to put everything around. So when we do start flying low, I'm ready. Um, this is an example, you know, behind the scenes of what it looks like at Atka Bay and with an emperor penguin colony. So I often travel um with my f-stop backpacks i've used those for quite some time i find them really durable for these kind of environments um and then here i've got an 800 prime i've got a 400 i've got my 300 so you know i've got um a lot of different options here um i think at this time they're all ef lenses um this is you know what it's like to walk over the sea ice um it's quite sensitive because the sea ice is quite unstable so you could easily just fall through. 
So we have guides with us and, and assistance to really help make sure, you know, everything is fairly safe. Um, this is actually when we finished back in the plane, I'd managed to sort of get hypothermia because I'd spent about eight hours on the ice instead of three. Then you recommend to spend a few hours because it's so cold. But um, yeah, I think like any wildlife photography, you, you push it, don't you? So yeah, that took a few days to recover from. Uh, this is what it looks like in camp with everyone and the pilots and the guides. Um, it's not very luxurious, but it's a warm place to de-ice and to put the kettle on. Um, and this is what it looks like when we're shooting. So on the left there, that's an example of shooting aerials um, over the the um, the continent and the ice shelf, and then the camp and some you know equipment bags, which I would generally find myself taking down. This would be packing up, ready to go after the shoot. Uh, I think this was on Christmas Day, so we all had a nice Christmas in the tent. It was actually quite nice. So, okay, so let's get on to um, the bears now. So, yeah, if you have any questions so far, um, please um, just message in the comment box and, you know, I'll try my best to get those answered. Um, but really now we're going to move into specifically looking at working in Alaska, working from a re uh, with the bears from a recent shoot that I, I just came back from. And, you know, the transition between the DSLR um, into mirrorless setup and what that means. And maybe I can hopefully give you some tips, um, you know, on the side of, you know, what cameras to use. Um, but also just a little bit about, you know, how you approach doing this kind of um, wildlife photography. Um, it's not easy. Um, and, you know, working with these kind of animals, you know, does take a lot of preparation and time just to make sure, you know, it, it, you can get into the right spot. So in Alaska, most of what you'll need to do is by plane, because unfortunately the roads aren't particularly accessible, especially in some of the regions of Alaska. So you'll find yourself, you know, having to make sure that your kit is broken down to a certain um, sort of level because most of the time the restrictions to get kit on one of these bush planes is pretty limited. Um, so this is when we left um, down sort of in Anchorage going up to Katmai and Katmai Reserve is just sort of north, it's south, I think it's southwest Alaska. So it's kind of a lot further north than down in southeast Alaska. Um, so this is what it would look like when we arrive at Brooks Camp. So Brooks Camp is a, a place um, where, you know, you can camp, you can stay over or you can visit for a day um, where you come in and it's a natural preserve. And the most amazing thing about Brooks is they have a, you know, it's, it's, it's built around Brooks River, which, you know, for, for those who are familiar with it, um, as you know, it's like a really amazing opportunity to come and you know capture the the brown bears of Alaska because of the salmon run and you know there are prime times of year so in June um sort of end of June July um is when the salmon start running upstream so it brings the bears out and you know they all come up to this river and they're you know obviously starting to hunt and you know get their fat reserves up and then in August it dies down and then in September, they start spawning off, they start coming down, downstream as they're dying off. So there's certain times to um, capture this. So I went in July and I went for a, a, about a week. And, you know, when you go to Brooks Camp, you can do sort of, I guess, one of two things. The first thing that most people gravitate to is they'll go to the falls and there are a couple of falls along the river. The main one which you can see here is the top falls and you know it is catered where you can you know sort of have a viewing platform and come up and get that angle. Um, you're not allowed to have tripods um, in this area because this is sort of where people will come and go and they try to maximize space. Um, so, you know, you, you, you can't have a tripod and I think you can really have a monopod and you could hand hold. So it really depends what lenses you're using as to, you know, how that will affect you. So when I arrived at Brooks, um, I was pretty overwhelmed. I didn't really know what to expect. And 
you know, wanted to go check the falls out because that's the iconic shot of the bear with the salmon, you know, jumping up into their mouth. Now, the week I had there, the weather wasn't great. So I was dealing with pretty fat, like, flat light for at least half of it, if not sort of two thirds. Um, and, you know, it was obviously quite overwhelming in the fact that there was a lot of bears. So, you know, in, in working in Alaska over the last sort of five, six years that I have, it's always been quite an adventure to try and actually locate bears because I've been, you know, not necessarily at a prime, prime wildlife spot. Um, a few tips if you do find yourself at Brooks Camp is, as you can see here, um, I'm shooting this um, with a fast shutter speed. So my shutter speed probably is around, you know, above 2000. My ISO is very low, um, around 100 to 200. I don't want to blow the highlights out in the water. Um, it's really challenging because if the light's not really there, then you're really dealing with, you know, a kind of your highlights are really, really, really pushing and you've got all that water and then your low lights on, you know, the dark, the shaded side of the bear, it's going to get really contrasty. So it's actually quite a challenging place to shoot unless you have that beautiful evening golden light, which then you have to make sure that the salmon are there and the bears are there. And yeah, it can, it really takes something for it all to come together. Um, with using a fast shutter here, um, what, you know, um, obviously you can get this kind of shot, but what I really wanted to try and push here was to sort of get some more movement in and try and play with the light that I did have, which really wasn't really there. So I thought, okay, this is looking flat. It's looking a bit crisp. What can I do now? I don't have a tripod, so I don't really know how the slow shutter is going to go. So I sandwiched myself sort of into sort of this tree and this bit of platform. And I, you know, really slowed the shutter down and just focused on the bear, which, I mean, it took thousands of shots, but focused on a bear where they froze for a second, you know, before moving the head and ripping the salmon apart. And this is an example of this. So obviously the salmon is moving, so you've got motion blur there, but you've got a much more silkier, less stark waterfall and the whites of the water. And then, you know, I've been able to bring up a little bit more detail in the bear, bear's fur on the darker side. And you've, you know, got a little bit of that sort of hairpin light around its head. So you've got a bit of that backlight. So that to me was a shot that I, I preferred. It gave a little bit more um, of a story and a bit more motion to it. Um, this one would have been back to a fast shutter. Um, now on the R3, you have the... Um, eye control or you have the sorry the eye tracking and I love using that feature so I believe you have it on the R5 as well and the one thing that I really enjoyed about using it is that the eye tracking so you know I was having it on our L servo and I was you know the salmon were jumping the, the bear was moving its mouth it was very erratic movements and it really really was you know putting my focus right onto the bear's eye and then I was wondering how that would work with the salmon jumping and if it would jump onto the salmon's eye. I think probably about 70% of the time it was focused on the bear's eye. So it clearly preferred and gravitated towards that, but it did jump. So one thing when you're using the eye tracking, especially if you've got a situation like this where you've got two species and there's obviously more than one eye, is um, the way to accommodate for any jumping if it decides to go to say the salmon's eye is just make sure that you shoot you know on an f-stop which at this I think this is about f11 so that allowed you know if I'd shot on 2.8 then potentially I wouldn't have that sharp plane and it would have if you know it jumped on the salmon's eye that would have been focused and then the bear's eye would have been soft or the bear in the background so I really want to try and keep that sharp so yeah um, you know, with your f-stop, you know, bring that right down so you've got less depth of field and it can really accommodate for the eye tracking if it does jump when you're dealing with this kind of situation. Um, and this is an image of, you know, when the bear gets the salmon and they tend to just rip the skin off. Um, I didn't, I didn't realize, but they don't really eat the full fish. And, you know, after a few days of a really good salmon run there and they're all out, you'll just see loads of dead salmon floating around with a lot of, um, 
you know, their flesh because the, the bears literally just skin them. Um, it's actually quite fascinating just to watch. Um, when you're on the falls and you're sort of higher up on that ledge, you can shoot down the river and, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming because you have so many bears um, if you're lucky to, to have that situation. And one thing I always say and I use across my wildlife photography is, you know, taking away is more. So you really want to isolate the characters. You really want to isolate the shot you would like the reader to see. Um, and here I like the shot, not because of the light. It wasn't, like I said, the light really didn't, you know, come on for me. But I really enjoyed sort of its movement and how this bear was just almost like drying his paw off. You know, he had one one leg on the rock and then just you know, had his leg up and then as he turned to sort of look over, it, it allowed for this shot. And especially seeing the claws, it was, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Um, this is um, now sort of an example of, you know, coming down from the falls. And um, I think just one more thing actually about the falls is, you know, you, your sort of prime length is probably somewhere between 200 to 400. A lot of this is shot on the 400. So this is the 400 RF lens, the prime. So I chose to shoot quite tight because I really wanted to try and get that moment, um, a more intimate moment. But, you know, that doesn't mean that shooting with a 7200 or something where you can pull back, you can get the whole falls and you can get the character of all the bears there. So, you know, don't eliminate that. Make sure you bring enough um, of a quiver, enough lenses to be able to carry you from probably somewhere from about 70 to 400. Um, so another thing you do at Brooks is you can have a permit and you can come away from the falls where a lot of people come and visit only, and you can go into the train with a guide. And for me, I think that was the most special moment. So this is um, us walking through and sort of basically starting at the bottom of the river in, in the national park. Um, most of the time you are in the stream, so you're up to your knee, so we've got waders on. And um, for me actually, not, not here, but I actually carried a monopod with the 400 Prime on and the R3 and had it over my shoulder, which because it's so light now, um, like that setup is considerably lighter than if I had my 1DX and the EF400. So I can actually really feel quite comfortable carrying it around. So this, um, this is an example of basically what happens at Brooks. You, you can walk around the train and what we call it is being bumped up the river. So as you go, you're going to have grizzlies that are 40, 50 feet away from you, just, you know, roaming past you down the stream. They can be with their cubs. Um, they can be up like this shot on the bank and you're down. So you're very, very exposed. Um, but you, you know, you kind of have like a bear score. You get trained and you know how to react if at some point, you know, a bear gets spooked or you end up running into them, which um, can be very intimidating. But you know, remember that, especially at Brooks Camp, that the bears are there for one reason, and that is to catch the salmon. So they really, really aren't interested in you at all. And the only reason they potentially could be, you know, threatened by you is if you get, if if you get in between a cub, um, one of their cubs, and them and themselves. So you know, I think just be very cautious and aware that you know never come in between uh, one of their young. Um, this was actually shot on the 7200 2.8 um, on my second camera body. Um, I was actually, for this shoot, I decided to go into Brooks Camp using a DSLR setup with my 1DX Mark III with my EF lenses and then my R3 with um, my RF lenses. So I could really understand, you know, the progression and jumping into mirrorless from DSLR and, and what it was that I liked and didn't like. So this um, this was actually shot on the 1DX and the 7200. Um, you know, some fun shots, you know, I think with wildlife and we can talk quite generally, it doesn't necessarily have to be about the grizzly bears all the time, but, um, you know, again, I think it, the, the main advantage for me, other than the fact of being in the right place at the right time and, you know, hopefully some nice light, 
um, is understanding your subject. And the best possible outcome comes from patience and being able to stay still and observe. And for instance, in this shot, I like it because it was quite different to most of the days I was there. And seeing interaction is, you know, really something that is 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 you know more driving to capture. So you know, this little one was playing with a twig as as mum was just sitting there and waiting for the fish to come down the, the stream. And you know, we were very close, so we had to keep very still. Again, you know, it's a shame that the light's not there, but it's it's you know, again, I think you. I guess you can't always have it all. And that's the thing, you know, especially with places like this, you have to book advance, book in advance. You know, you really just have to get out there. And a lot of the time it was raining for us. Um, this was a great shot that we managed to achieve because as we were going up the river, um, you know, the bears are coming down. So we would move across into the verge. And then, you know, we would just kind of sit and wait. And there's so much going on. It, you don't really have to wait for long. So one thing I did test out with the R3 or, you know, and the mirrorless, so this would be the same for, you know, really any of the R-series cameras, R6, R5 is, you know, how, you know, if I put it on my eye tracking, you know, what what could possibly pull it away from that? Because one of the biggest things for me was working with my DSLRs and, you know, I would really, really have most of the control myself. So, I generally will, you know, use one shot and I will just make sure to manually just always make sure I focus on the eye. And in occasions like this, and I'll show you another one in a minute, which will probably be a better example, um, it, it still keeps, you know, the eyes and the, the head of the bear in focus when you have all this water that's being um, sprayed around because what can happen is, you know, it can jump focus onto that and then that leaves for the water to be in focus and then the action of the bear not to be and obviously when that happens then the shot's redundant so i'll carry on talking about that once i get to the next shot but again just a couple of shots of us sort of in the bank of the river and you know watching these 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 grizzlies play a, a favorite shot of mine always and it just always cracks me up is how they walk on their hind legs uh, hind legs and just walk walk through the river um it's a really peculiar thing um so you know they're just focused on the fish it's another shot and as they come down um you know what you must do is you just have to really keep your distance and wait so they'll either go past and you wait behind the bank or you move over to the other side so what you don't really determine where your path is because you're going to be bumped by the bears around the river as to where they're coming and going you're sort of trying to stay out of their way um this was shot in the rain so we had a couple of rainy days and i actually quite like it in the end um you know having the speckled rain and and, and shooting quite a fast shutter speed um it gave an extra sort of texture there um day three or four the light got better and you know we started to get a little bit of more contrast now into the shots and you know it's can sometimes be really powerful when the wildlife actually does notice you and and it you know gives you that portrait um and i find that some of the stronger shots are that because it kind of connects you with you know with 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 the reader so you're connecting you know by having that eyesight um Another thing with Brooks and being, you know, down here in the river, which is, you know, a really, really good point is that you can be on eye level. So a lot of the times at the falls, um, you're a little bit higher. But here for these days, we were, you know, wading through the river, you know, you can get into your prime place. And, and with any wildlife, I'll always try to keep as low as possible and, and to get on the same level as the wildlife, whether it's bears, whether it's penguins. Um, even when we're shooting killer whales, it's really nice to try and, you know, in the water, get as low as possible so you can get that dynamic shot. Um, again, looking that, you know, you've got a lot of water movement. So, you know, you, you don't want the water to be sharp and then it, it you know, jump onto the water, whereas not keep onto the bear. Um, again, here, you know, there's a lot of water droplets as they're running through the river. And, you know, you want to keep that Christmas on on the eye of the bear. 
So this is the shot that I'll go back to talking about re regarding the eye tracking. And with the R3, I, I was eye tracking. And then, you know, with something like this, when there was this fight with these two males, I realized that, you know, my eye tracking was just going berserk and was obviously being picked up with this all this water. So I guess it's just being really mindful that that can happen. And in a case where you're shooting quite wide open, um, you're going to lose focus on the actual animal's face. So two solutions, either don't shoot wide open. And I think on this shot, I was probably always around five, six to uh, F, yeah, probably F, F, F5 to maybe F8. And that just allows a little bit of wiggle room. Um, and in post, you can probably sharpen it a little bit and it will all just come back into line. Or just take your eye tracking off and um, just yeah go on to uh one shot or i'll servo and just literally focus where you want that to hit um so it won't get distracted by by the water droplets um otherwise it will jump so that that's definitely one tip i can can say for for this kind of sort of action wildlife um something that's you know i was trying to achieve is being in line of sight so i really wanted to get this shot where i was down low in the water and you know the the grizzly was coming towards me and to have a fish in its mouth was amazing now obviously when they're charging towards you you've only got a certain amount of time before um you have to just step out the way um to say the least otherwise yeah it could be <laughs> a little intimidating so um you know you're you're really trying to anticipate the shots of where the bears are going and there's not just one there's potentially five or six around you. So I, I kind of got lucky here, you know, this is a nice shot, um, everything's in focus and it was, you know, front on, which I really wanted to get. Um, another shot I like is just to keep motion in it. Um, I didn't, you know, I probably could have done this with slow motion to, you know, get some really nice movement. I decided to go with a high shutter. Um, it wasn't really possible in the situation I was with to keep changing my shutter speeds because there was so much going on. I just wanted to keep it on sort of one generic setting, which kind of worked for the few hours I was in this river section, which generally was fairly low ISO because I had enough light and, um, you know, a high shutter, you know, with anything really with action sports or with wildlife, you always want to keep that shutter above 1200. I sometimes go quite high for two, 2,000, 3,000, sometimes even higher. Um, so, um, yeah, just, just you know, keeping out for the sort of little actions that they do just leaves for a, a slightly different shot. And again, here, when they're sort of drying off, um, you can have, you know, especially on the R3, quite a, a long sequence because it shoots at so many frames per second that, um, if anything, it was almost too much for me. I had so many shots to choose from. It was, you know, like a movie. So, um, you know, that was, that's really, um, it gives you a lot of advantage because if you can shoot with that, then, you know, you can really come back to pick the perfect shot later. Um, looking for, you know, more action. This is where the mum was, you know, hunting and leaping onto a salmon. You've got the, t the you know, the two young at the back. And just kind of, you know, looking for storytelling. So with photography, it's not just about necessarily one shot. Like think about a story you want to build around, um, you know, build around that. Um, so, you know, always sort of keep an eye out for, you know, how to tell the story of what actually is happening. So here, you know, she's she's getting a salmon fair young. So I wanted to try and keep them in and not go too tight. Um, you know, it's always really nice when they come out of the water and you get the droplets coming off. So, you know, just, um, you know, sort of the water really plays a sort of an extra part, which I think is really nice. Um, then we even had, you know, mating bears. So we were sitting sort of on the sides for quite some time as there was the interaction between the male and the female, how the male came up, um, you know, and presented himself and, yeah, you know, all this kind of interaction is is so important with wildlife. It's really the special moments. And also this shot's more powerful because I was down low and I was at their eye level and not too far away. Um, you know, the shot will completely change when you're higher up or, you know, you can't get down low. 
don't forget, you know, there's a lot of other things going on. So although it gets, you know, it's really easy to focus on, say, the Grizzlies here, you know, I was surprised to see this um, this chipmunk that just also was feeding on the salmon and some like appreciation that, well, something that I really started to appreciate was how actually this, this the, the part that a salmon plays in the ecology and the circle of life is so important. You know, it not only feeds the bears, but it feeds so many other critters from the eagles, from the chipmunks, you know, and, you know, everyone <laughs> has a part to play. So, you know, these chipmunks wouldn't be able to catch a salmon if the bears didn't leave most of the salmon for some, you know, another species to eat and have already peeled the skin away. So, it was, yeah, it was really interesting. So, you know, when you go to these places, you can get really focused, but, you know, make sure that you don't, you know, you make sure you don't keep too focused where you miss other things um this was an example of um getting a little bit too close to a baby and they actually bark and when that happens the mom stands up and she will charge so she charged towards us and protected her baby luckily nothing happened but you know just be aware that you know there's so much going on and um you know obviously try not to put yourself in a situation where that can put you in harm's way um and then really just to finish off you know there's you know there's Katmai National Park in Alaska where you know you can go and shoot the grizzlies but there's plenty of other amazing places in Alaska which are more accessible and a place I really enjoyed going to was Wrangell in southeast Alaska and, you know, there you've got the black bear, which is very different, very different, you know, from shooting the grizzlies and a real pleasure. And we went into the Tonga National Rainforest um, down around Wrangell area and um, or the Tonga Forest and, you know, sort of started capturing other things. And, you know, having the lush greenness around you, the terrain is completely different. And I think I really appreciated that in my shots because I was also realizing that Brooks you know, that's one terrain, you've got the river, but, you know, there wasn't much foliage and, you know, other sort of colour sources. So I really enjoyed shooting down here. Um, and, you know, obviously the national bird, um, bald eagle, I mean, they're everywhere. And, you know, I really wanted to capture it, um, you know, as, you know, as close as I could and, and in flight. And I had an opportunity here where, you know, I was up high in the trees and I was observing this eagle for probably a few hours and it was, you know, raining and it was shaking off and then it sat there and then I was getting tired and I was like, oh, should I go? I was like, no, I'll stay because I know as soon as I go or fly away and the same old frustrations with, you know, wildlife photography. And yeah, finally it flew and I, you know, I wouldn't have got this if I didn't have my R3. Like the eye tracking just pin sharply, just stayed with the bird so it allowed me to give that you know give that security that motion to the camera because I knew it wasn't going to jump it was going to focus on the eye and it's so reliable so I just had to you know click and follow the motion and pan as it left and I didn't have to worry about refocusing um, I made sure I shot it you know around f8 so I didn't have too much depth of field because I knew that if I didn't you know, I knew that I was close and I didn't want to have the wing out of focus and the head in focus or vice versa. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of other things to shoot. And I think with the mirrorless cameras, having the eye tracking and then having fast uh, shutters and the new technology is really enabling us to capture wildlife in a completely different way. Um, you know, this was the eagle sun baking, you know, a bit more of a snapshot pulled back. But you know, just, you know, beautiful colours you can find. Um, and again, you know, one of the black bears just, you know, in the rocks, um, you know, ready to catch the salmon and shaking off. So, yeah, Alaska in general is plenty to find. And, you know, there's plenty of different regions to go and do it. Um, so I think that's really it from me. Um, I hope there's been some good insight. And, We've got about 10 minutes for some Q&A. Um, it's been pretty quiet on the chat, but um, does anyone have any questions uh, regarding anything, you know, um, anything about potentially, you know, going to mirrorless, any camera chat of cameras that you have that you have questions about? Um, has anyone been to Brooks Camp before? Um, does anyone want to share any experiences that they've had there? 
or is anyone looking to go to shoot, you know, the Grizzlies? Um, okay, so we've got a message coming in now. Um, have you photographed bears in Canada? And if so, would you suggest Alaska over Canada? Oh, interesting. Um, I have shot bears in Canada. And um, one of my favorite places to shoot bears in Canada is the Yukon Territory. And there's a road called the Cassia Highway. And actually, the nice thing about that is it's free. <laughs> so you can you know, get a car or a camper and drive through this territory and just off the side of the road, um, you can see brown bear, you know, sort of strolling and the colors are just phenomenal. So I, 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 so for Canada, yes, you can definitely shoot bears, uh, black and brown, and the terrain that they're on is absolutely amazing. Um, would I choose that over Alaska? I think it's two very different things. I think even in Alaska, whether I went to Wrangell to shoot the black bears or I go to Katmai to shoot the grizzlies, I mean, it's two completely different scenarios. I think if you have the money or and you feel confident and you really have a passion to go to Brooks and to experience the closeness and the amount of bears, I would go to Brooks, hands down. You're not going to be disappointed. If you're more of the adventure photographer where you don't want it handed on a plate and you really want to go, you know, searching where... For me, sometimes actually I came away from that thinking, I love that bit. Like in Wrangell, when I saw this black bear, I love the fact I'd been hunting for like three days and nothing. And then suddenly I had this experience. It, it rewarded me so much. So I think, yeah, both are amazing and, and you can really find very different aspects from, from both places. Um, okay, so I got another one coming in. Um, sorry, it's a bit small here, Give, <laughs> bear with me. Um, Trevor, Trevor Waters. Um, hi, new to this. What's the best way to determine exposure when shooting on snow, please? Um, so how I look at it with, you know, shooting in polar regions or snow is I generally don't really bother with filters because um, I always feel that um, I never, yeah, it doesn't really, I think we always think that going to the snow, everything's going to be overexposed, but actually sometimes, or most of the time, I find it's actually quite a soft light when you're actually shooting. Um, so I, so with the exposure, sorry, I'm, I'm getting off track here. Um, yeah, so with the exposure, you know, ways to compensate is, you know, unless it's like golden hour or it's really low light, I would just, you know, make sure that my ISO is as low as possible. So keep it on 100. Um, and that can probably stay like that the whole time you're there. And then um, I would just shoot at, you know, F8 most of the time. So sort of that's kind of your sweet spot. And, you know, don't be afraid sort of to go, you know, F8, F F11. Um, and, you know, really you can control the light by that. Um, obviously, if you want, if you're, you know, shooting, um, a, 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 say, a penguin, say a Gen 2 penguin um, and you're close up, you know, a lot of the time you're not going to have a lot, a lot of that glare or the white. So if you're focusing on the species and you're on ground level, you could if you if you've got the capability to you know open up to 2.8 on 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 a lens of such, then, you know, you could still do that. And you're not going to be overexposed most of the time because you're really cropping in. So I think it's quite situational. Um, maybe with landscapes, you might want to take some filters um, because you're exposing, you know, really for a much wider shot and generally pointing at snow. But yeah, I think with the exposure, just somewhere between F8 and 11 normally works. Um, okay, what else have we got here? We've got uh, Jenny, uh, fantastic images and interesting insights. You've mentioned a number of lenses, which would you recommend for a relative beginner or landscape wildlife photographer? Um, so lenses, I mean, uh, as would you reckon for a relative beginner landscape model? Okay, so uh, landscape. Um, I mean, I love my 16 to 35. I like the fact I would choose my 16 to 35 over my 24 to 70 or 24 105 because I like to be able to, um, you know, get to 16 and shoot wide, um, especially when I'm in places in the Arctic or Antarctic and there's so many huge mountain ranges. So the type of landscape I would generally shoot is very vast. And I really like to, you know, capture as much as I can of that. Um, 
that would go to six, to 35 and 35 on that end you know is your kind of nice landscape frame so you know that always gives me indication that if i do want to um you know pull in or focus in say if i'm shooting the mountains then you know i got one establishing wide and then i can come on my you know come into the 35 and then really just pick a bit more detail then if i want to you know really come in and shoot detail in a landscape then that's where i'd use my 7200 um so i would change lens so 7200 whether it's the f4 or the 2.8 are great lenses. The RF lenses, and this is with Canon, the RF lenses are lighter, they're more compact. Um, they're great. I am in transit, in tra transition actually in, in swapping over to that. They're a lot, a lot more easier to just move around and shoot with. Um, so that'd be my landscape. Um, so 16 to 35 millimeter 2.8 um, EF or RF, and then 7200 F4 or 2.8 RF or EF. Um, if you're on the RF system, I'd suggest getting the RFs. Um, and then wildlife, um, 7200 is really nice because you can put environment. This would have been the shot here that's on screen is a 7200. So it gives you enough room to bring the environment in, but also it brings the animal in. If that was on a wider shot, the bear would have just completely disappeared because it's not overly... Um, you know, um, singled out anyway, just because of the the light and and the the rocks. And then you know, most of my lenses that I shoot tight wildlife on is either the 300, 400, or 800, and they're prime lenses. So they are you know on the higher end of the scale for 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 the monetary side. Um, maybe some other options if maybe that wasn't in budget. Um, maybe the Canon 100 to 500. I think that's a great travel lens. So you could shoot wildlife and do landscapes with that. Um, and, you know, there's there's some other lenses out there as well. Um, okay, what else have we got? Andy, Gregory. Hi, Lucia. Did you have any problem with the midges, mosquitoes in Alaska? Um, no, I, I have done in the past, but I didn't this time. I felt the, the only time I've had... Um, it's, it depends which area, basically. So in Brooks itself, no. I think the when you're somewhere near the moving water, then that's absolutely fine. It just keeps it away because you've got wind or if you're by the ocean, I don't have any issues. Although I did take nets with me, but I never use them. And that was for a month trip. When you go inland and Katmai is kind of not really in that. It's, well, it's it, it was still fresh enough. The midges weren't really there. But when you go into King Salmon, which if you have to get to Katmai is an airport and a place that you stay before going in, it is awful. Um, there were so many midges. Um, yeah, it, it was just, you wouldn't really want to shoot, but luckily there wasn't really much to shoot. So yeah, it just really depends. So I'd say inland and you know no running water or not by the sea midges, anything on the coast, you'll probably be fine. Um, and then if you go to Denali, um, because that's inland and Denali is another national reserve, which is quite nice to go to, um, there'll be midges there. So by the lakes. So I would say always pack a, a net and then if you need it, you need it. If you don't, then, you know, obviously that's OK, too. OK, last question now. I think got a couple of minutes. Um, hi, so Mark uh, Coventry, highly cheer. I've just up. Graded my 1DX Mark One to the Mark Three instead of investing in mirrorless. I couldn't commit to changing over with the expense of stayed with DSLR. I love it for the quality of the stills, but also being able to record video in 4K is so much better. How much difference have you noticed from the 1DX Mark Three to the R3? Okay, well that's that is a good question. I think really, you know, that's you know, I think what a lot of people are thinking and. Um, with, with Alaska, that was really, Mark, why I took the 1DX and the R3 to really give it, you know, give myself an example as to which I preferred right through from shooting, capturing the images right through to the edit and post. Um, I still love my 1DX Mark III and um, there's something, it's funny how we all move, you know, from film camera then to DSLR now to mirrorless, it's just you know constant there's always constant change and I almost feel like the 1DX started to feel a bit like a film camera um you know to my R3 because of you know the technology and the AI in it it was just very different um I 
I'm in no rush to get rid of my 1DX Mark III. I, it still serves a purpose and I absolutely love it. I love the feel of it. I love the quality of the images. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the quality is, is that of a match of the R3. So I don't think what you've done is, you know, a mistake. I think it's absolutely fine if you want to go that way. Um, that camera is amazing and, you know, will give you what you need. Um, the, 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 I guess the, if I can try and be as um, helpful as possible, the things that switched me are a few things. So switch me to mirrorless from the 1DX. One is the way technology is going. So I would rather jump on that now and get used to it and start working with it rather than being left behind. At the end of the day, you know, this is a new technology that a lot of companies are going into and this is the change for the future. So for me, um, I just wanted to move with that. And that was just a personal choice. There's no right or wrong with that. And then um, the R3 and, you know, whether it's uh, video or stills, um, I just like the, you know, the flip out screen, there's um, the ergonomics of the camera being lighter and smaller. So actually having the R3 to hand and then having the 1DX is quite a big difference. And for me, traveling and working these in conditions very regularly, it was a bit of a deal breaker. Um, and I also really like the eye tracking capabilities, um, you know, re really, which I think just sort of gave it the the, uh, the AI in that just gave it the, the the sort of the up for me, so that was a few things. But you know, as far as they go, they're they're on, they're on par. But it's is a different feel, so it really is what you're comfortable with and and you know how you would like to shoot. Um, okay, last few. So we've got um, what uh, what always has a place in your camera bag other than a camera. Um, so uh, I always have face moisturizer. <laughs> um, I always have um, a bottle of water. Um, I always have a phone charger. I have a couple of remote chargers, like, you know, battery packs to charge cameras off. Um, I have, what else do I have? Mm, I have a rain cover. That's really important. Um, and I have my aspirin inhaler because I'm asthmatic um I think that's probably about it really um oh and plastic bags um I when I was in Alaska I found that they have you know these dry packs for you know the fishermen and when they catch the halibut or the salmon and um because you do share the waters with a lot of fishing fishermen or fishwomen and um actually sometimes the waterproof um casing yeah you know sometimes you'll camera waterproof stuff can get a bit fiddly so I actually really like using these dry pack bags and just cutting a hole out and putting it on my camera stuff and shooting if it's raining so I always have some kind of backup bag just in case it does start pouring so that's a little trick um okay so John thank you thank you so much for listening Andy thank you um this is the last one um John Austin did you see a great difference between the RS7200 F4 and the 2A? Obviously a big price difference. Um, I've actually used both quite a lot. Um, and I would say no, actually, in the fact that I really, really enjoyed using both. And I used the F4 in quite testing conditions up in Scotland where the light wasn't you know, necessarily the best. And I managed to capture these porpoising dolphins from boats. I was shooting otters I absolutely loved it and the nice thing about the f4 is it's more compact and especially when shooting otters I had the r6 and the 70 to 200 of um r uh, f4 rf and I could hold it with one hand whilst you know sort of suspended off this cliff or these rocks and shooting and the other thing is putting it on the silent shutter it, it was so silent it enabled me to get the shot of this otter which I wouldn't have got so um the only reason I would shoot with the 2A is because um, if I need the light and most of the time I would choose that lens because you never know when you're going to need it. But in the case of the, both the 7200, I think they're really, really, really good lenses. And I, I think, yeah, if it's the price, it, you know, is, is, is something that has to be considered, then the F4 would, would be really nice still. So it wouldn't be a lens that I would, um, it would be a lens I, I would compromise that on because it, it's a very good, good lens. Um, okay, well, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. I think that's all the questions. Um,
thank you, thank you ever so much for your time and for coming into the virtual show. I hope this gave you some insight, some inspiration, a couple of uh, tricks and tips. And if there's any more questions, please feel free to reach out to the guys at Campkin Cameras. They will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have following this. And a big thanks to everyone at the camera store and also Cambridge Photography Week and to all of you guys. So, yeah, I hope you have a lovely time. And, and also, um, if you have any more questions for me, I'm always open to helping. So if you want to email me or, you know, message anything over at a later point, then please do. OK, well, thank you very much and have a good rest of your day. Bye.